We are gonna learn how to code in quarantine. I hope you are all staying at home. It's the safest thing you can do for yourself and for others right now. It's never been a better time to learn how to code. It's a job you can do remotely from your home. Now, there are a lot of levels or layers in learning how to code, and it's something that you never really complete because technology is always changing and there are new applications of technology being created every day. But if we start with level one, Level one is learning the basics of any programming language. This could be Java, C Sharp, Python, any programming language, and that's not HTML or CSS. It could be JavaScript, any language of your choice. And so this could be C++ if you wanted to. Although you could choose any of these and that would cover this step, my choice would be Java just because it reveals a lot to you that isn't really revealed in other programming languages. And so like Python does a lot of stuff behind the scenes, so does JavaScript. But C++ reveals so much that it's overwhelming and there's a lot to configure and there's lots of management to do. And so Java is a really good medium level programming language that will give you the best of both worlds. It won't be too overwhelming, but it's going to reveal things that you need to understand in order to create better applications. So what do I mean by the basics of a programming language? This means, do you know how to create a variable? Do you know how to create a function? Have you done looping mechanisms? So it's a for loop, while loop. Have you done if statements? Have you run a program in that language? Have you created a hello world program? A really good test to see if you've completed this level is can you create a tic-tac-toe game in this language or can you create a hangman game in this language it's making something that's basic that's focused on using the tools of the language it's not so much focused on user interface it's more focused on can you use the tools of a language to complete a task both hangman and tic-tac-toe have very strict rules to follow and that they have a very clear logic of how they work. So all you have to worry about is how can you use the language to do these things, to create a game that does this, to simulate the logic of this game. This isn't something that's perfect. You're not giving it to other people to use. This is something that's on your computer. You're building it locally. You can press the play button in the IDE. Ideally, you know what an IDE is and a text editor in this phase, you learn those things and you run it for yourself on your computer. Someone else could sit at your computer and run it with you. Maybe it's two players, and so two players are playing off the same computer, but you're not doing anything with hosting yet, and you're not doing anything in the cloud. You are also not importing any libraries or frameworks at this point. Anything that's external, everything, anything that you would need to run a Hello World program, those are the only things downloaded on your computer for this phase. There are a ton of online resources you can use. I have a course on LinkedIn Learning called Learning Java, and it walks through the foundations of programming using the Java programming language. I also have a few other courses up there. There is a Getting Started with Technology course, and that kind of goes through the different programming languages and what might be best to start with depending on your interests. There's also Code Academy. They have lessons that are on their free tier that you can use. LinkedIn Learning is a free trial, and then you pay for it, I think after 30 days. They might have a special offer now that we're all in quarantine from the coronavirus, but it's some kind of free trial and you get access to the whole library. You can try my courses, see if they work for you. I think they're great, but um, I think it's definitely something to try. This is also the time, ideally, you learn about the command lines, the command prompt, it's the terminal, all that good stuff. It's a way to navigate your file system using text. Depending on which language you choose and whether you use an IDE or not, you may be thrown into this on day one with running a Hello World Python program in your terminal. But for others, it might be a little bit more hidden. You might not know about the terminal unless you actively search for it. So this is me telling you, actively search for it and learn how to use it. This is also the phase where you decide if you like coding. If you've gone through all the steps in phase one and you liked doing them, they didn't feel like work, they felt exciting, kind of like doing an escape room type thing or a puzzle, then you're ready to proceed to level two. At level one, maybe that's it. You do level one, you learn how to code, and I think everyone can do level one. No matter what career you're in, you could be a lawyer, a doctor, a restaurant owner, a business owner, everyone can do level one. Everyone can learn the basics of a programming language and understand this is kind of what software development is as a baby step. 
And it's okay if you don't want to continue. You know, maybe coding's not for you and that's fine, but at least you tried it. Everyone can achieve step one, level one in quarantine. Now level two in learning how to code. This is where you begin to import libraries into your program. This is external functionality that you've downloaded from the internet in the form of a library, in the form of an SDK, and you're using it in your program. This could also be something that's built into the programming language, but you have to import it into your class. Libraries are well tested and they give you extra functionality to work with. If you're looking for libraries to try with this new programming language you learned, whether it's a Python, it's a Java, it's a C Sharp, just Google common Java libraries or common Python libraries or common JavaScript libraries. Just Google that. You could even add beginner in there and you'll find something that you'll be able to import into your code and use the functionality to make your application better. As you do this, you're probably going to find out about the standard library of your programming language. These are extra functions that are built into the programming language that make it easier for you to code. So not only external libraries, but libraries that are included in your programming language, you should know about those too and what they do. As you're getting these libraries from the internet, you're probably gonna learn about a package manager. For Python, that's pip. If you're using Node, which Node isn't really a language, but that has NPM as its package manager, there's gonna be a package manager for your language. For Java, it's Maven. And that's how you're gonna get access to these extra libraries or modules of functionality. You also might be calling APIs at this stage. There are various libraries out there that allow you to make HTTP requests to the internet, and you can do that to get access to another company's API. So at this stage, you're also learning about APIs. Some applications you can make at this phase are a program that scrapes a website for something, so it gets the best prices for a given flight, or scrapes the internet for pictures of dogs. It could also be an application that uses a library in order to produce something. And so Python has a library called Pillow, and with that library, you can create Instagram-like filters and pictures. Now, if I've said something that you don't understand, leave a comment down below and I'll make a video on it. I already have a video on APIs and that sort of thing, on what a library is, what a framework is, but if there's anything I've said that doesn't make sense and I don't have a video on it, leave a comment down below. All right, level three, hosting. Now mobile is a little bit of a different world because you create an application and then you submit it to an app store and then the app store approves it and then once it's approved, it gets put onto the app store and anyone can download it all around the world. Websites are a bit different. If you're working on a website or creating an API or doing something where it requires people to go to the internet in order to access it, you need to put your application on the web. This means if you have a Python application or a C Sharp application or a Java application, a JavaScript application, you need to put it on the internet in a place where others can find it and be able to access it. This requires learning a little bit about how the internet works, how infrastructure works, how cloud computing works, but the best place to start is to find a platform as a service platform to host your application. And so when you, after you've completed a baby version of your application, application, you're going to host it somewhere so other people can find it. Using a platform as a service is one way to make your application accessible to people around the world. One common one is Heroku, so figuring out how to get your app onto Heroku so other people can access it. If your app is a little bit more simple, you can use github.io or github pages. That's not going to be perfect. It's going to be more of a static web page, and so I would go for Heroku. If you want to learn more about infrastructure and servers and storage, and all that good stuff and all that on the web, then you're gonna wanna go to an AWS situation. And so that's Amazon Web Services. Most of the time you're not gonna need it at like this level, if you're just working on your own, you're making your app and it's gonna go on the internet, Heroku should be fine because then you don't have to worry about servers or your infrastructures. Heroku is a platform as a service, you're using it as a platform for other people to access the application. Amazon Web Services is like a sludge hammer and so there are a variety of infrastructure as a service tools that AWS has. AWS is a cloud provider and so I believe they also have platform as a service offerings but they're mainly known for the servers that they have and the fact you have all of this customization that you can do. It's a lot of stuff to involve yourself with. If you want something simple, Heroku is the way to go. But if you are interested in the cloud and all of that stuff, AWS has a ton of resources for that. Now, I call infrastructure and understanding hosting a requirement because it's how your code gets to your customers. It's how your customers or your clients are gonna see what you've done. I think you should be responsible for understanding the basics of how that works because if that part of your pipeline 
does not work. So your app is great and it's over here and it's awesome and you can access it, but if no one else can, then the application is likely not serving the purpose that you wanted it to serve. It's not helping the people you wanted it to help. This is also this phase, this hosting phase is a good phase to learn how version control works. And so you may have heard of GitHub. We talked a little bit about GitHub with platform as a service, but it's also a version control tool. There's also Bitbucket, but learning how GitHub or Bitbucket works is really important because a lot of development teams use it. It's gonna allow you to have different versions of your code and be able to keep track of that. And you can use that version to then connect to your hosting platform. So say that's Heroku or it's AWS or it's Google Cloud, and those can be in sync. And so you can control what version of your application goes out to your customers. Phase four is framework. And so I do have a video on frameworks, so I'm not going to get too deep into this, but iOS in particular, working on mobile, working for the Apple phone, that is known for its frameworks. And so you're going to have no problem if you're doing that. Python has Django, and Django is a very much a sledgehammer framework. It's a lot to learn. Java has Java Spring, C Sharp has .NET, and really what the framework is gonna force you to do is re-architect your application. And so the framework basically, on the most simplest terms, Think of it as someone else has defined the architecture of your application. And so if you're working on a game, the framework could say, okay, I have an update function, I have a setup function, and I have a hit obstacle function. And so those function names and those conventions are already in place for you, and you just have to go in and do the implementation. So you have to decide, okay, on that update, so every second, whenever this update function is used, these are the things I want to happen. And you have to go in and find that place in the code and in the framework and write that implementation. You have to understand the conventions in order to be able to use the framework well. So this is a phase where you're really learning the conventions of the programming language as well as the conventions of the framework. We talk about uh, code being Pythonic and so Python code being Pythonic means it's easy to read, it goes with the coding standards of the Python programming language, it's something that's understandable, it's something that's simple, it's something that's it's not overly complicated for the task at hand. So this phase is really learning about the coding standards, coding conventions, as well as frameworks and what those conventions are for your programming language. Now what's funny about all this is that none of this is gonna get you a job. You can learn all of the different things that I've just said and go through all those phases, but what's really interesting is that programming interviews are about something else completely different. They might ask you questions about kind of what we've gone through so far, but the core of it has to do with data structures and algorithms, and that's phase five. Now, when we're talking about data structures, we're talking about arrays, linked lists, stacks, queues, trees. These are all different ways you can organize and store your data. The algorithms part comes with how do you interact with these structures in order to make it beneficial to your application. So how can you use these data structures in an efficient way with your application? So I do have a course on this. It's called Programming Foundations Data Structures, and it's in the LinkedIn Learning Library. And if you are going into coding interviews or want to get prepared in any sort of way for that, that's a great place to start to really get a strong foundation of the the understanding of the data structures and then there's also an algorithms course on LinkedIn learning that you can look at as well as tons of resources online to do that what these programming interviews are trying to do and no company has mastered it yet they're trying to test your problem-solving skills and the only way they've found to do that is to ask you these data structure questions these questions are likely things that you cannot memorize the answer to like everything we've talked about in the past like if you practice it enough you kind of memorize it and you kind of know what the coding conventions are the data structures questions are more unique and there are, there's definitely a pattern to them so you can kind of get used to the patterns and be like, oh, okay, this problem matches this pattern and so I'm gonna use this data structure in this way but they're really trying to get after your problem solving skills. And sometimes you can go and memorize all the answers to the things on link code and do fine in the programming interview. That is a way to go. But data structures is a realm of its own. And a lot of people will just do phase five that I've talked about and kind of skip skim over the other phases so that they can get the job and be in the job and then learn on the job as a software developer. That's another route you can go. Fake it till you make it. Now level six, this is where you're probably in a software development job. You're still learning, you're still learning how to code, you're learning how things, maybe you're one or two years in. You've been creating new features, you've been solving bugs, 
but what are you going to specialize in besides software development? So software development, people, you know, you get a task, hey, there's this bug, we need to fix it, you go into the code, you fix the bug, you add the new feature, you do whatever's done, and you move on to the next task. These specialties are what are gonna set you apart as an engineer. One specialty is infrastructure. So understanding, and we kind of already covered this in level three with the hosting, but deeply understanding how servers work, how your network works, how your code gets from your computer to the internet. Understanding DevOps, so the DevOps infrastructure is kind of one big piece but understanding how to deploy code, how to make your deployments more efficient, that can be a whole area you focus on. Another area is security. How can you make your application less vulnerable to hackers, to attackers? It could also be lower level programming. So are you someone that really likes working with hardware and sure you can use a high level programming language like a Java or C Sharp, but do you wanna do something lower level with C and interact with the hardware? Data science is another one using Python and using computer science to analyze data and to analyze various trends about your users. Is it 3D mapping? That's something like whole 3D graphics, that's a whole specialty. It could also be AI, so artificial intelligence. That's a whole realm you could go into. And it's not like you learn one specialty and then you're done, like you have the one infrastructure or the one cybersecurity specialty and that's it. Like you, ideally you're a jack of all trades developer, so then you could do any of these jobs. Like you're not limited to being the iOS, Apple developer, you can do all of these other things too. It can often lead to you getting a higher salary and this has become more prevalent in the market now, but companies want jack of all trades developers so they don't have to spend as much money. Now the last level is system design and design patterns. Now this is the tech lead level. Now you're not only thinking about kind of the small, like how do I solve this bug at hand, but how do I create large scale solutions that impact my entire organization? It's being able to make decisions about what testing framework are we gonna use? Are we gonna do microservices? Do we wanna use Jenkins or CircleCI? What is our database schema gonna be? And this is not something that you're doing alone, like you're definitely communicating with other people on your team about how you want to architect this big service that you're creating. It's understanding what you might be missing before the implementation, so before giving specific tasks to other developers on the team. At this phase, you're likely mapping out proposals. You're mapping out, okay, this is what I think the architecture of our thing should be and presenting that to the team and the team being like, okay, maybe we should do this, maybe we should do this, but being a part of that conversation and contribute wisely and understand what might be missing, that's level seven. And this level seven is really what they're trying to test you in the data structures phase. Like, can you design large scale stuff and point out any of the assumptions to save the company time and money? Well, that's it for this video. Thank you so much for watching. I hope this helped you in some way, shape or form. Check out my courses on LinkedIn Learning and I'll see you next time. Happy coding.